Welcome to another session that is part of the Inspiring IB Mathematics series. In this session, we will be covering IB Mathematics applications and interpretations, both standard level and higher level, topic one, numbers and algebra, uh, just tips and tricks with the Inspire calculator. So over the next 30 to 40 minutes, we'll be going through some uh, ways that the Inspire can enhance both you and your students learning in the IB Mathematics AI courses. So let's uh, first let me introduce myself. My name is, is Dan Wilkie uh, and I will be uh, chatting with you over the, the next 30 or 40 minutes. So let's jump right in and we're just going to take a look at what the Inspire can do for you to save time on the exams, to make your learning more enhanced, to grab your students' attention. So topic one, of course, is numbers and algebra. In this course, the Applications and Interpretations course, we're trying to apply as much of the information that the International Baccalaureate wants us to through application. How do we apply the math that we learn? And so Texas Instruments have really done a good job to enhance that for, for your classroom. So we're gonna look at some different, uh, some basic questions that IB asks, uh, and then how can the Inspire enhance that learning and that and your teaching, obviously. So we're gonna jump right into just a, a simple question here, uh, because with numbers and algebra in topic one, you're gonna to see topics such as financial math, sequences, series. Uh, and so we're gonna show you just a few things that will you know make your life hopefully a little bit easier uh, so i have a series of questions that we're going to go over and the way it's gonna the way it's going to be presented to you we'll look at a question see how we would answer it on the calculator to help you out uh, and um, hopefully you'll get you get a little bit of something out of this so looking at this first ib style question uh, it says sophia pays 200 dollars into a bank account at each uh at the end of each month the annual interest paid on money in the account is 3.1%, which is then compounded monthly. So we're going to find the value of her investment after a period of five years. Uh, so, you know, this is just a, a great place to start with the topic of numbers and algebra because it gets me to get, it allows me to show off, you know, the menu button on the calculator. So, to answer this style of question, of course, since we're dealing with money, we're going to be dealing with finance. And one of the one of my most favorite uh, functions on the calculator uh, for the Inspire is the finance menu. So if we click on the menu button, um, and uh, of course I'm in a uh, <laughs> a question page, so I need to go to a calculator page. Let's start there. Uh, so I need to go to a calculator page. Uh, and then I need to press the menu button. And looking at this menu, uh, you see a, a whole lot going on for you and your students. But of course, this question, and we want to be as quick as possible uh, for our students, especially when they get to exam time, to be able to answer these questions. Uh, so they're going to go right down to number eight, which is finance. And there are a number of things. We're going to look at two things here uh, with respect to the finance menu. Uh, the first thing is the finance solver, uh, and the second thing is the amortization. So let's just jump right into that finance solver problem. Uh, so if I were to click on finance solver, a wonderful uh, template box fills in, uh, pops up, so we can just fill in the numbers that we're supposed to, uh, and, and our life has made so much easier. So looking at this, uh, thinking about the question it says, uh, Sophia pays $200 into a bank account uh, at the end of each month. So where do you think you would put that value in the finance solver? Uh, and hopefully you are all thinking that we're going to put that into the payment. Uh, so now there's a question about what should the sign be uh, for uh, this payment? Should it be positive? Should it be negative? And we'll talk about that uh, in a second. So let's just put 200 uh, in that payment section right now. Uh, and then we'll move on from there. It says the annual interest paid on money uh, in the account is 3.1%. Uh, 
Uh, so you're going to go up to the percent section, all right, and then just type in 3.1. You do not have to change it to a decimal, uh, and that's why TI put this little percent in parentheses to remind you that you should leave it as a percent. So we'll have 3.1% there, all right, and then it says it was compounded monthly. So we are going to scroll down, all right, to the payments per year and the compoundings per year. There's two sections here. Uh, and since uh, we'll just look at the first one that says payments per year, uh, and since it's compounded monthly, we're going to just put in a 12. Now, you also have little arrows here uh, at the at the right end of the of this box. So if you hit up, it'll go up to 13 down. It'll go down to 12. So you can use those to toggle. All right. But your numbers going up and down or you could just type in those numbers. Uh, so you'll notice that the compoundings per year automatically changed to 12 as well. All right, so we don't have to even worry about that one. So the payment uh, at the, when do we make the payment? And this is at the end. So that was a, a part of the question. It says, Sophia is making a payment at the end of each month. So we're gonna leave that as, as end. And to be honest with you, IB likes to leave it at the end. So students really shouldn't have to worry about that but um, they should still pay attention to that. So what does that leave us with? Uh, so we have, um, with respect, and, and right now I am in, uh, you'll notice that my interest went to 31 tenths. Uh, so my, my calculator is in uh, a fraction mode and I'll change that in a second, but that 31 tenths is still 3.1% uh, there. So what do we have left? Well, we have uh, our N, and those are the number of total payments there. So if we look at the question that was given, it says, find the value of her investment after a period of five years. So how many total payments, all right, would there be made there? So if we have five years and we have uh, compounded monthly, so that is 12 payments a year for five years, all we are thinking of is 12 and then times, all right, we will say five. So 12 payments, five years, and you'll notice it did 60 for us. Woohoo, that was awesome. We didn't have to change that. Now, if you already know that that's 60, you can just type in 60 uh, and that will work just as well. So what are we solving for? It says, what is her investment after at the end? So would that be a PV, which is your present value, or would it be an FV, your future value? So hopefully you are all thinking that it's your future value. So we're just going to click on that box and you'll notice that at the bottom of the screen, it says that it says press enter to calculate the future value. Uh, and all we have to do is hit enter and we have our answer. Now you'll notice that um, the payments that we made, we left it as a positive value, but the future value came up as negative. All right. Uh, and so you know, there's some discussion for you to have with your students about which one should be positive, which one should be negative. Because if I were to make the uh, payment negative, all right, and do the same thing with um, the future value, you'll notice that that is positive now. So some teachers like to explain this as you're making payments. So you're actually taking money out of your pocket and making payments. So that minus sign represents the the, the fact that you're losing money. But either way that you look at it, if you keep it positive, the, the future values will be negative or vice versa, um, you still get the same answer, which is $12,961.91. Okay, so please make sure that IB, whenever you're dealing with money problems, all right, they want you to round to two decimal places there. All right, so make sure uh, that we are rounding correctly here to 0.91 uh, for that final answer. So the value of her investment at the end of five years, $12,961.91. So that was your finance solver uh, for that particular problem. All right, so let's escape out of that. Uh, and again, we did that from a calculator page. So I'm going to quickly, because this will, you know, kind of drive me a little bit crazy. Uh, I'm going to fix the settings here for my document. Uh, I'm at the exact, I'm going to make it approximate just so we can leave it as a decimal. Okay, so moving on, okay, to the next question. 
All right, it says Brian decides to purchase a new car with a price of 14,000 uh, is that Euro, uh, but cannot afford the full amount. The car dealership offers two options to finance a loan. So let's look at finance option A. A six year loan at a nominal annual interest rate of 14% compounded quarterly. All right, uh, no deposit is required and repayments are made each quarter. So our question is find the repayment made each quarter. So looking at this, uh, we have definitely some different options uh, that we can do here. So we can still use our wonder, wonderful finance solver. All right, uh, so, and that's what we're gonna do at first. So where would we go for that? So again, we're, we're in a question page here. So I, I need to go to a calculator page uh, for this. Uh, to answer this question. Uh, so I'm going to just get over to my next page. Oh, there's my second set of questions. So here's my calculator page. So find the repayment made each quarter. So I'm going to go to menu, finance, and then again, the finance solver. So again, we, we have a clear thing that we're going to fill out here. So what is the total number of payments? Well, it says a six-year loan uh, at an annual interest rate compounded quarterly. So six years compounded quarterly. So that means six times, all right, four, because there's four quarters in that year. And we get, oops, sorry, uh, we get 24. Uh, to go to the next box for the interest, I'm just going to hit tab to scroll down there. Uh, so now my interest was given at 14%. So I'm going to leave it as a 14. Uh, my present value. Okay, so what did, what was the loan for? All right, so that would be $14,000. All right, so if I were to put in my $14,000, okay, my payment, all right, uh, what is my payment going to be? Well, that's what we're solving for, so we're going to skip over to my future value. What do we want our future value to be? Well, we want it to be nothing uh, at the end of this, and then my my um, my compoundings and my payments per year, it was quarterly, so we're gonna say four, uh, and that automatically changed to four, and we're at the end of each month, okay? So we are going to go up to our payment, and we are going to hit enter there. And so what this tells me is that I am paying out of my pocket $871.82. Again, remembering to round to uh, two decimal places. So that is the answer to our part A. So now we're going to leave this and go back to our questions. So we answered that part A question, find the repayment made, which was again, $871.82. Uh, so now we're going to go to um, finance option B. So a six-year loan at a nominal annual interest rate of R percent compounded monthly all right, the terms of the loan require 10% deposit, monthly repayments of 250 euro. So we are gonna find the amount to be borrowed for this option. All right, so how do I find that answer? How I find the amount to be borrowed? Well, that one doesn't really require too much uh, crazy math there. Uh, so we are going to just, uh, instead of me going to a calculator page, uh, I'm just going to pop up my scratch pad, all right, to do some quick calculations. So remember when students are doing problems like this on their calculator, they might have a question here. They can hit that scratch pad button and we get a calculator page nice and easy. And then just hitting escape will take us right back there. So how do we find the amount to be borrowed for this option? All right, so uh, we are going to, you know, uh, since we need um, a, uh, we're going to take, we have to deposit 10%, all right? So we basically need to subtract 10% of the original loan amount of $14,000 to see how much we are borrowing. So we are going to do a little quick math here. So we're going to do 90%, so 0 0.90, not a comma, uh, 0 0.90 uh, times, and then we're going to do our 14,000. That's our initial, that's our loan that we want. So basically 90% of that all right, would be 12,600, all right? Or we can find 
because that 90% is what we have left of the 14,000 after we've taken out the 10%. So we can do 10% of that 14,000. So times 14,000. Uh, and we get 1,400. And then we can take our original loan amount and then subtract that $1,400. So we get the same answer. So just doing some quick math on the scratch pad, we can get the loan amount of 12,600. All right, so that answers part B, the amount to be borrowed for this option. All right, so now we're gonna go on to letter C, which is find the annual interest rate, which is the R value. All right, so we're gonna go again back to our finance uh, solver. So I'm gonna go to my calculator page, hit my menu, finance, and finance solver. So looking at this problem, we're gonna say, okay, so how many, uh, what are the number of payments are over the length of the loan for this option B that we're gonna be dealing with? Now it says it was a six year loan compounded monthly now. So we got six years and then we're gonna multiply that times the monthly. So the 12 months in a year. And if I hit my tab, I get 72. So that, that's my total number of payments for that one. Now we are solving for the interest. So we're gonna come back to that one. And you'll notice again, I keep hitting tab to go from box to box to box. All right, so my present value, what my loan amount for is 12,600. All right, then I'm going to go to my payments. So it says that we needed to pay uh, 250 euro, all right, each month. So we're going to do a little, I'm going to say, since I'm paying it, I'm going to put a little minus 250 out there. So that's the money coming out of my pocket. And again, we're hoping to have a future value of zero. So we're going to skip over the future value, leave that as zero. Then we're going to go to my payments per year, which since it's compounded monthly, uh, I'm going to pay... 12 months, uh, 12 payments for the year. And my compoundings are also 12. So having said all that, now I get to go up to my interest. And so all I have to do is hit enter. And I have my interest rate there, which is 12.6%. Now, please remember with IB, if it's not you know, explicitly stated what to round to, uh, students have options. They can just list this whole answer if they wanted to. Uh, or they can round to three significant figures, which is always recommended if they don't say anything. Um, so I'm just going to write it as 12.6%. Okay, so that was finding the interest rate. So we got one more part to this question, uh, which if I go back there, it's down at, if I scroll down, it has part D here. It says Brian's car depreciates at an annual rate of 25% per year. Find the value of Brian's car six years after it is purchased. So how can I do this one? So how can I uh, find the depreciated value? All right. So this is where we're going to get into something. Uh, we're going to do two different ways. Of course, I'll show you the finance solver once again. But I'd also like to show you something else that the calculator has, just in case uh, you'd like to not only use it for your class, but maybe in real life, you know, where we're you know, your students or you are are purchasing a house or a car or a boat or something that needs those annual or monthly payments to kind of uh, to kind of, you know, uh, to see what, what you're going to owe after six years uh, for this. So uh, if we do uh, the little um, so we'll go to our calculator page, we're going to go to our menu finance uh, and then our finance solver. So how do we do the depreciated uh, information? Well, uh, reading the question once again, it says uh, Brian's car depreciates. Uh, so what's the value of Brian's car after six years? So it's depreciating per year. So we're just going to say six times one, which is just six. All right. It says it has a depreciation rate of 25%. All right, so what are we going to type in in our interest rate there? Well, so if depreciate means it goes down in value, so we're going to put a minus 25 there, all right, for our depreciation rate. Uh, and so the original value of the car, which is our present value, all right, will be 14,000. Uh, that was the what we purchased the vehicle for. Um, 
but then our payments we're going to we're not paying per month it's just how much is it valued at the end of each year so we're just going to leave that at zero and what we're solving for is the future value so we'll come back to that box uh, but the um, payments per year the compoundings per year it was an annual depreciation so we're just going to leave that as a one so we can then go to our future value what is it going to be worth uh, after six years and here's what we are worth all right so we have uh, 24,000 uh, 20, uh, excuse me, $2,491.70. So you notice it has a minus sign there. Um, you know, I could make that positive. If you feel better about yourself, I could have made my uh, present value positive and then it'll make my future value. Or I could have made my present value negative and my future value would be positive there. So after six years, you know, it went down to, to under $2,500. As, as its as its value, which kind of stinks. But um, that's what happens. Pull it off the lot and it goes down in value. So I want to quickly just show you an alternative to this, uh, which I think is a, a neat little tool. Uh, and that would be menu finance. But this time we're going to do amortization. All right. You can actually get your uh, values from an amortization table. All right. So uh, and but some of you may never have used this before. So I think this is a really neat lesson to kind of to kind of pay attention to. Uh, so when you hit the amortization table, this pops up. So what the heck do you type into these two sets of parentheses? So we're looking at, you know, how do we know uh, what goes into the amortization table? So we're gonna go to our catalog. And remember, if you go to your catalog uh, and if you hit the letter A, you'll hit all the A things that are on the calculator. It's all alphabetical. And wouldn't you know it, the second thing there is your amortization table. So there's a lot going on. It's almost as if you're filling in uh, those empty boxes on the finance solver. You're, you got the first thing is your number of payments and then your N value, your I value, your present value, your payment, future value, you know, your payments per year. You know, all that is very similar, all right, to you know what we enter in uh, that finance solver. So this is a good place to spend some time just so you can show students, you know, what do you actually type in there? So I'm gonna escape out of that. So I'm gonna type in what we know. So we know that the N value and the number of payments are both six. So it's gonna be over a six year period. All right, then we're gonna put in that uh, depreciation percentage, which is that negative 25 is gonna go down 25%. All right, you'll notice that we're separating things with commas. All right, and then we're going to say our present value, which was 14000 All right, uh, and then we are not making payments. Our future value is basically what we're looking for, so we're going to leave that. You'll notice I put two commas next to each other, so it's kind of leaving a blank there. Uh, and then our uh, number of payments per year, um, and then the number of compoundings per year, which is it, its yearly depreciation, so they're both going to be one. All right, so these are the values that I'm inputting for the amortization table. I hit enter. All right, it gives me this wonderful thing. Uh, so many wonderful values that you could talk about with your students. So we're talking about the initial, uh, the initial value of the car at year zero before we even take it from the lot is 14,000. And then after each year, it's, it's, if you notice, it's going down by a certain amount. All right, uh, so it shows you how much your car is losing in value each year. So yes, down here at the bottom, you know, right there at the 2,400, all right, 91.7, that is the answer we got from the finance solver page. But it also shows us, you know, in addition to that final number at year six, what it is at year five, four, three, two, and one, but also what we're losing each month. So the kids don't have to figure that out themselves. So it's showing you all that. All right, so upfront, it's losing the most value that first year, and then it's creeping down just a little bit less, a little bit less, all right, um, each year. So I really like the use of the amortization table uh, for that, but um, I'll leave it up to you uh, if you wanna do that. Now we can also, you know, there's the compound interest formula uh, that we could use as well uh, for, for your classroom, but um, uh, that is something that you can easily show just by typing in uh, the formula. 
Uh, now we're going to move into a, another good numbers and algebra uh, topic, which is sequences and series. Okay, uh, sequences and series. So where do we go uh, for sequences? Where do we go for series? I'd like to spend a little bit of time with the menu here before we get into a problem. Uh, the finance was pretty easy. We went to a calculator page. We hit menu and then finance, and it was right there. Uh, so for sequences in series, so if we're trying to find a pattern in numbers, arithmetic, geometric, all right, recursive sequences, uh, or if we're trying to find a series, which is adding up all those sequence, those patterns, those numbers, uh, there are ways on the calculator that we could uh, make our lives easier, make your students' lives easier. So the first thing I'm going to do is, of course, jump to the menu screen. So on a calculator page, if we go to the menu, uh, we have uh, some different things that we can choose. Uh, I'm going to go to um, just down to my statistics, all right, uh, and some different things that we would use on this screen. All right, we have, um, so for the statistics, we have our, our list operations. All right, so we have, uh, we can do sequence, we can do uh, a cumulative sum, we can definitely spend some time uh, creating or, you know, taking the sequence and finding out the terms of a sequence just by plugging in a formula, which is kind of nice here. Um, so if you want to, if we hit the sequence button, uh, all we would have to do, again, if you don't know what to type in, I go to my catalog, go down to the S's and go to sequence, which is not too far. It's right there. Uh, so you'll notice that we have to type in expression. We have to type in you know, what the variable is in our expression. And then we want to type in, you know, the, you know, the low number where we're going to start. So we're going to plug in like, let's say number one, we're going to plug in, you know, up to what number. If we want to find the first eight terms of a sequence, we would do one comma eight. Uh, and then if our step, you know, if you don't go anything different than a step of one, meaning your sequence is just going by one, two, three, four, and so on, then you can leave that one blank. You don't have to type that in. That's why it's kind of in the brackets there. Uh, but if you want to change your step, you know, go by twos or threes or whatever, you can type that in there. So again, use your catalog. It'll show you what you need to type in. So for your sequence, all right, you're going to, let's just make something up. We'll say 3x, you know, uh, plus 2. There's our, our, our function, our expression. And we're going to say, okay, please use the variable x. And we want to find the first eight, all right, terms of the sequence. So if I hit enter, here are the first eight terms, all right? And you'll notice that it has the nice pattern where it goes up by three. This is an arithmetic sequence, okay, uh, that when we plug the numbers one through eight in for x into this expression, it gives us those terms. Very nice, very simple way to find the sequence of values. Uh, and I usually wait... <laughs> until we're reviewing at the end of the year for this. I, of course, want my students to show as much work as possible, but this is a nice way to double check their answers uh, for that. So that is one place you can go for that, uh, for a sequence. And you know what, what if we wanted to do the same thing, but graphically, could we do that graphically? So I can go to a graph page. You'll notice that right now, my bar up here is functions. So if I want to change the function notation to maybe uh, graphing a sequence, we can go, of course, to menu and then graph entry edit. And then we can go down to sequence, which is down here at number seven, uh, which is number one there. So once we change that, it gives us our, instead of our f of x equals, it'll give us the notation of u sub one of n equals. So where n is your term of the sequence. Okay, so if we type in that same 3x plus 2, all right, you don't have to fill in the initial terms, okay? You, if you want to, you know, whatever you get when you type in 1, uh, so that would be a 5. You could put 5 there, but you don't have to. You can leave that one blank. Uh, this third row, basically, it's going to give you the first 99 values. It goes from 1 to 99 going by 1s, okay? That's what that third row means. So if we hit Enter... You'll notice that, okay, um, what happened to my, let's see, tab. Oh, <laughs> can anybody tell me what the teacher did wrong here? 
All right. So hopefully you understood that even teachers make mistakes, and this would be a great opportunity to have a discussion with your students about the importance of using the correct input variable. <laughs> so I love when that happens. Uh, so you'll notice here that in the parentheses, it says U sub, it has an N here. So, and your good old teacher put an X. So this is a great learning, <laughs> a great learning tool. Uh, and I would actually, hey, recommend doing that as a teacher, you know, even on accident, you know, you know, it was a great lesson. So I'm going to put an N there in place of it. And now it should give me my answer. All right. So looking at this, you'll notice that it plots just the points. So this is the sequence that we got on the previous page, uh, on the calculator page. So on this page, we had five all the way up to 26. So this is our five, our eight, our, uh, and so on. So if I hit my menu and then my trace and then graph trace, now you'll notice that at term two, it's going to give us a value of eight. All right. And if I keep scrolling at term three, it's 11 and 14 and so on. It's going to keep going. Now you can also find these values in the table. So if you hit control and then the letter T, uh, you'll see that here's my term. So term number one is five, term number two is eight, and so on and so forth. So we can get the terms that way as well. So I just like to show the kind of graphical approach. Uh, it's very nice uh, to kind of see, you know, you have your algebraic way. Uh, you know, you could do it by hand. You could type it in the calculator, get the sequence here. You can type it in a graph, get it there. So there's a nice ways to get a sequence of values. Uh, now, what about a series? What is a series? Now, remember, a series is where you're going to add, all right, the terms of the sequence together, all right, to get that. So how do we do that? Well, uh, a couple different ways. So if I go to my uh, calculator page, I am going to, um, if I go to menu and then down to statistics again, and then this time I'm going to go to three, which is list math, all right, you'll see it says sum of elements. So I have the ability to take a list of values. So in my um, in a in a spreadsheet, let's say I can have a list of values that I can find that sequence of terms just by using that. Okay, uh, and the way we would do the sum of values, I'm going to just show you real quick. All right. So uh, if I go to my catalog, you know I'm in the S's already. Let's go down to sum all the way down to S U. And we'll get there soon. All right, so there we have our sum. All right, and you'll notice that we have to do our either a list or a matrix. Uh, so you could have, you know, your values in a spreadsheet or in a matrix, and then you can add them together. Okay. So uh, most students and teachers tend to uh, not kind of focus on that. There's formulas that are given. So you can do the sum of an arithmetic sequence. You can do the sum of a geometric sequence. All right, and there's formulas, and IB is great. They give you those formulas on a formula sheet. So all you have to do is type those in uh, right on a calculator page. Your life is easy. Or if you fancy, you know, Sigma, you can hit the math template button, which is just to the right of number nine. And right here in the middle, smack dab in the middle, is your Sigma button. So we can do uh, a little Sigma. So we can say as X starts at one and goes to eight. So I can take these eight terms here that I have and add them together uh, to form a series. All right, so, but what I need, I have my starting number that I'm gonna plug in. So if I plug in one for X, I'm going to get five, two in for X, eight, and so on. I'm gonna go all the way up to plugging in eight for X, but I need something to plug it into. So you, your students need to type in a, an expression, a function that they can plug those numbers into. And once they hit enter, it is 124. So what we just did is we added those eight numbers together to get 124. Really quick, really easy. I love the Sigma button. I love this math template button right here. It has so many wonderful things for your students to quickly find all right, and use, especially when they're doing assessments. So now let's Let's move on. Let's actually do some sample problems. All right, to finish things off here with topic number one. So I'm going to move on to our first question. So our first question here, it says the most expensive tickets are in the first row. The ticket price in yen for each row forms an arithmetic sequence. Prices for 
the first three rows are shown in the following table. So here are your first three rows of prices in yen. All right, so now it says in, in part A, it just says write down the value of the common difference. Well, that's a pretty straightforward question. Uh, to find the common difference, again, all we have to do is take, you know, any term of the sequence and subtract its previous term, okay? So if I take um, row three, I'm going to subtract row two from it. So it's going to be, I'm going to pull up my scratch pad. I'm going to say my 6,300, and I'm going to subtract from that the previous, the row two, so 6,500, okay? And that gives me my, all right, so again, teacher error, it should be 6,550 there. So it gets a negative $250. So as you notice, the prices are decreasing by 250 yen, not dollars, by 250 yen each row. I could also have used the second row, so the 6550, uh, and then I'm going to subtract from that the 6800, all right, for the first row, and I get that same uh, negative 250. So that is your common difference, all right? So it's going down by 250 yen each row. So that was the answer to part A. Part B, uh, we're going to calculate the price of a ticket in the 16th row. So that means we're going to, since this is a, since it's going down by uh, $250 each row, uh, this is a, again, an arithmetic sequence. And when we're trying to find the ticket price in the 16th row, we're going to use the nth term uh, formula uh, that hopefully you, you use from the formula packet. All right. And that formula uh, to find the 16th term, uh, I'm going to pull up my scratch pad. It's going to be the first term, which is 6,800 yen. And then we're going to add to that in parentheses n minus 1. So n is 16 in this case, minus 1. All right. And then we're going to multiply that by the common difference of negative 250. All right. So that's going to give us the cost uh, in the 16th row. So 3,050 yen. Now we could also uh, find the, uh, use that sequence uh, function in the menu. So menu statistics we're going to go to list operations and then number five which is sequence so the way we do that there is we're going to type in the expression first so the expression is 6800 and then plus and then we're going to do our n minus one times all right our common difference of a negative 250. all right so that is our expression and we're going to use n so i used n as my uh variable there and we're going to find terms 1 to 16. all right uh, and we pipe that in and you'll notice that the last term is 3050. now the reason i did 1 to 16 is basically because i wanted to see all the values there uh going from you know 1 to 16 and 3050 was the last term all right now i could also graph it so we can go to our uh, to our graph, change it, make sure we're in the sequence mode, and we can type in our expression again is 6,800. All right, and we're going to add to that. Don't forget to use n, Mr. Wilkie. Great job, you're an excellent teacher. All right, times and then negative 250. So we have our function. So we can't see it because the numbers are huge, but really what's important is I'm going to hit control T to get my table and I can scroll down to the 16th row, which is right here at 3050. All right. So multiple ways to do that problem. So let's go back and answer part C. All right. It says find the total cost of buying two tickets in each of the first 16 rows. So you'll notice that in um in our scratch pad uh we found that all these 16 numbers we have all the numbers here so we can actually use that to kind of uh find our sum uh so we're going to because basically what we're doing is we're taking each term buying two tickets so multiplying it by two and then adding that all together to get a total price uh, so there's multiple ways that we can do this problem Okay, so we could, uh, there's a, a formula, a sum of the first n terms formula uh, for an arithmetic sequence or series. So that is uh, going to be 
uh, the end value, which is 16. All right, divided by two. And then in parentheses, we're gonna say two times that first term. The first term again was 6,800 yen. And we're gonna say plus the end term, which is 16 minus one. And finally, we're going to multiply that times the common difference of negative 250 yen. All right, so what that'll do, this formula will take just one seat in each of the rows and add them together for the first 16 rows. So that's what we get as our total. Uh, and then since we're buying two tickets, all we have to do is multiply that times two, and we get our 157,600 yen would be the cost. Okay, so we can do it that way. Um, then we could also use sigma, which I love. So let's go get sigma. And we're going to say n tab 1, tab 16, tab. And then here we're going to put in our little expression, our equation. So 6,800 yen plus n minus 1 times, whoops, don't want that. So times the negative 250. Okay, so this will find again that seven seventy-eight thousand eight hundred, which was one ticket for each of the first sixteen rows, and again just multiply that times two, and we get our answer. Same thing. All right, so all this wonderful stuff here um, that we have, you know, available to us, you know, just at our fingertips. All right, so moving onward, we have one final question to cover. Okay. Uh, with respect to sequences and series. So let's move on to that final question before we call it a lesson. Okay, so a ball is dropped from a height of 1.8 meters and bounces on the ground. The maximum height reached by the ball after each bounce is 85% of the previous maximum height. So what you'll notice from this picture, uh, this is a classic, you know, um, geometric sequence problem where since it's going down by 85%, it's a, it has a common ratio. So it's a, uh, it's a percentage that it's going down by. So we're using multiplication, division only, uh, unlike the arithmetic variety where we're adding, we're subtracting there. So here is our picture. It says show that the maximum height reached by the ball after it has bounced for the sixth time is 68 centimeters. And you're gonna round to the nearest centimeter. And that's where you have to pay close attention to because sometimes the IB will throw in that, uh, make sure you round to this specified value. All right, so how do we do uh, this particular problem? All right, uh, when it's, you know, after the sixth bounce. So we can do, you know, very similar things. So I'm going to go to my next page, which is the calculator page. Going to go to menu, going to go to statistics, down to list math. And we're going to, oh, sorry, down to list operations and then do sequence. So in our sequence, it's basically the same thing we did, okay, for our previous problem, all right? But now we're, since it's geometric, our formula or our expression is gonna change. Now, there are two ways to do this, and it really depends on your teaching style and how you're gonna demonstrate this sort of problem to your students, uh, because, you know, this, First bounce, if we go back to the picture here, all right, so it's asking for uh, after the sixth bounce. So we drop it from a certain height, and the certain height was 1.8 meters, all right, and so it's being dropped, okay, uh, so that first height starts before that first bounce. And so what we're looking for in this problem is um, after it's bounced for the sixth time, so it's going to be bouncing once then a height, a second bounce and a height, third, fourth. So there's a couple different ways you can look at this problem. All right, depending on uh, the, that original height and how that's used. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that sequence function. I'm gonna put in my geometric expression now. So it's gonna be my initial height was 1.8 meters. All right, and then I'm gonna multiply by you know, it's it's 85% of that initial bounce and each subsequent bounce. So I'm gonna put in my 0 0.85 here. All right, and then I'm going to raise it, all right, to the N minus one power. 
Okay, so now here's where we have to have a little discussion. So I'm using the variable n. All right, my initial value, my my first, uh, we're starting with bounce one. All right, but then I'm going to go to seven. Now, why would I use seven if I'm just saying after the sixth bounce? So you'll notice that I've included the first height here of 1.8, and then my exponent is n minus one. All right. So to get to that final bounce, all right, which is what I'm looking for, all right, uh, I needed to include that 7 because if I plug the 7 in for n, 7 minus 1 will give me a value of 6, and that's that sixth bounce height. So then if I hit enter, okay, what we should notice is that here is that sixth bounce height, okay, uh, which is 0.6788, blah, 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 all those decimals. All right, so that is one way we could have done it. The other way we could have done it is we could have uh, done the same sequence. Okay, so I'm going to go up and copy and paste down here. Uh, so, and all I did was hit the up arrow. Wherever it was blue, I hit enter, and it moved down. So some teachers like to use n as our starting value. Uh, so that would mean I would change... Not where I start, the one stays the same, but instead of seven, I'm gonna put six down. So again, and that's a preference about you and your teaching style uh, and how your students best understand things because it gives us uh, basically the same answers there. All right, so you'll notice that, hey, look at this last value. Wasn't that the same last value that we had from the previous problem, the 0.6788, blah, 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 all that stuff. All right, but are we done? Okay, are we done with our work? And the answer is no, because you'll notice that I used 1.8 in each of these problems. All right, and that was in meters. But the question was asked for, uh, was asked in centimeters. All right, so really I would have to take, you know, this problem, this value right here, this point six, blah, 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 all that. I'm going to copy that down. Uh, and put that right there. So that's the answer in meters. So to get it into centimeters, of course, we're just going to do a little bit of multiplication by 100. All right. Uh, and then we have our centimeters answer, which is 67.88. Uh, now, if you wanted to be in centimeters from the get-go, you didn't have to use 1.8. You could have had the students change that to centimeters right from the beginning. Okay? All right. Uh, now, is there another way we could have done this? Well, of course there is, of course. We could have done it graphically. So we can say menu, go to our graph entry edit, sequence, and we're going to type in. Now, in our sequence, this time, instead of an arithmetic variety, we're going to do our 1.8, you know, uh, times, and then in our parentheses, our 0 0.85, because it's going down by 85%. So we only have, so when it says it's, it, it's not going down by 85%. It's we have 85% of the height remaining. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that in case I, I, I was confusing earlier on. So I apologize if I was. So um, again, just 85% remaining. So here is our wonderful function. And you'll notice that we get this nice uh, sequence of dots here going down in an almost um, you know, decay type fashion, exponential decay. Uh, and that'll keep going, 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 going. So if we're looking at, if I were to do my menu, trace, graph trace, okay, looking at the value. So here was that seventh bounce. Okay, so um, uh, so we reached a height. So that was the height right before that seventh bounce there, which is our answer. We multiply that by 100 and we get our answer. Okay, uh, so that was a graphical approach to doing that problem. So then the final question is find the total vertical distance traveled by the ball from the point at which it is dropped until the fourth bounce. So what does that mean? So basically looking at this picture, we're trying to, see, okay, if we have four bounces, so one, two, three, four, so that's right here at the end of the picture. So we want the total distance traveled from dropping it, going down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So that's the distance we want to travel. So how do we do that? Well, this is a 
uh, a sum type of problem. So we're going to be adding heights together. All right. So how do we do that? Well, again, you could, I like to use my sigma. All right. So let's use sigma here. All right. So we're going to, again, it's after, uh, until the fourth bounce. So I'm going to go get my, uh, my scratch pad. Go ahead and get the math template. Sigma. We're going to do our little n equals 1. I don't know why I just typed that in. n equals 1. And then we're going to go up to how many bounces actually happened. So again, I'm going to go back to my picture. And you'll notice that starting up here, I went one bounce, two bounces, three bounces. Until I reached the fourth, I didn't actually bounce to get another height. So I actually stopped at that bounce. So that is why, if you were questioning why we have a three up there, um, that is one way to do that. So, and then I'm going to type in my 1.8. All right. And then in parentheses, my 0 0.85. All right. And then I'm going to raise that now. I'm only going to raise it to the n power. All right. Because I only had three bounces. All right. And so I had three up there. And so that gives me that wonderful answer. Now, for those people who want to, you know, use the n minus one formula, we could do the same thing, all right? The same thing, but instead of having just the n, we can have n minus one, and then we would go up to four, all right? Which would give us that not the same answer, all right? So that included, you know, that fourth bounce there, okay? So what would we have to do there? So what's the difference between these two values? So if I went from one to three, so I had one bounce, okay? Uh, and then I, it's basically counting the heights after bounce one, after bounce two, after bounce three. That's what this 3.935925 stands for, all right? So how do I get my final answer? Well, remember, we're going after a bounce, it goes up and then it goes down. So there's two distances being traveled there. All right, so I have to take that answer, okay, and multiply it by two. And it gives me 7.87185. All right, but what am I missing? All right, these are the bounces that happened after the first, second, and third bounce, going up and then coming back down. So what I'm missing is the dropping of the ball. Okay, so I need to add to it that initial 1.8, all right, for that, all right, and get 9.67185. So there's a little bit of work for that one. So now what about this uh, second problem where I went from one to four? So in this one, again, I actually included the 1.8, that kind of pre, that first bounce. But because it's the first four terms, I included it on bounce one going up and going down, okay? So I included a, a 1.8 meters going up and a 1.8 meters going down. So what am I going to do about that? Well, first, I have to multiply this by two uh, because, again, we're, we have heights going up and heights going down. So we get that. But now I don't want 1.8 going up because we started at 1.8 and dropped it down. So I need to take that answer and subtract 1.8 from it to get the same 9.67185. All right, so there are two different ways to use sigma there uh, on the calculator to get that uh, answer. Uh, and just let me double check. Did they say, um, so let's escape out of that. It says find the total vertical distance traveled by the ball, which uh, it doesn't say to do it in centimeters. So you could just leave it as your answer of 9.67185, okay? So uh, that was uh, another little sample, all right, to do uh, the sequences and series on the calculator, both graphically, algebraically, using sigma, using the sequence function, graphing a sequence. It's just so many things that, that are offered to you. Uh, so uh, all we did in this uh, this time that we are together is talk about a few tips and tricks with respect to finance, sequences, and series. All right, now there's so much that this calculator has to offer. Uh, so I suggest please uh, 
go through the calculator, play around with it, have your students explore, uh, just working with the numbers and the, and the functions on the keypad itself, going through the menu for each of the pages that the calculator has to offer and have them play, have them explore, have them show you, have them show other students how to do stuff on the calculator. Uh, they're gonna learn more. I learn something new every day, which I just love. Um, there's just so much to offer on the calculator. Uh, but uh, I want to thank everybody for listening uh, and um, just enjoy, you know, this wonderful calculator. Enjoy IB, enjoy math, uh, and have fun applying it to everything you see around the world. But I appreciate you spending time with me. Uh, have a wonderful day.